Estamos en Laza, Puerto Rico, con William Leo Grande, profesor de gobierno de la American University y uno de los expertos en los Estados Unidos en relaciones entre Estados Unidos y Cuba. William, thank you for the interview with Claxo TV. My pleasure. How many mentions are about Cuba in this program of Laza, Laza, Puerto Rico, this year? There are over 400 individual mentions the name Cuba. of the name Cuba in this program, uh, which means there are dozens and dozens and dozens of panels devoted to various aspects of, of Cuba. Uh, and there are several hundred Cubans from the island who are here in Puerto Rico for this LASA conference. I think it's a record uh, more than any previous LASA conference. The reason is the agreement or is it before the agreement? Because the, the program was written before the agreement. The program was written before the agreement. Uh, and so Cuba has always been a major topic at yeah. LASA. I think the number of Cuban participants, however, is, is higher than usual because of the agreement. It was much easier for Cuban participants to get visas to come. In previous years, a number of Cuban participants were denied visas by the State Department. And this year, very few were denied. What's your opinion about, or your analysis about the rhythm of normalization? And what does it mean, normalization? Well, it means two different things, which is uh, important okay. to distinguish. One is to restore normal diplomatic relations, yes. and that's the simplest thing. The two sides have been talking about that since December 17th, and they're very close to agreement now. They've resolved the two big issues, was getting Cuba off the terrorism list, and also um, the issue of Cuban being able to get banking services in the United States, finding a bank that would yes. handle their mm -hmm. transactions. Yeah. So those are taken care of. Mm -hmm. The other issues still being discussed are how U.S. diplomats are able to travel around the island and who they can meet with. Yeah. But uh, every indication is they're very close to agreement. The second idea of normalization is much more complex, and that is the overall normalization of the bilateral relationship. Principally, that means removing U.S. economic sanctions, removing the embargo. And that will take an act of Congress, so that's going to take longer to achieve. But Raul Castro in the, Latin, in the American summit was very comprehensive about that, very reasonable. He was. He, because he said, as I remember, and of course you remember better than I, he said that, okay, we will wait and it will be hard and long. Yes. He said in, in the just before the meeting personally with Obama, he said, we have to be patient, very patient. <laughs> so I think he understands that this is a long process. I took, you know, we've, we've been uh, at, in hostility with Cuba for over 50 years. So you can't reverse that overnight. It takes some time. Uh, and there are a lot of different issues that have to be worked through, but there seems to be now importantly, a political commitment on both sides to work through those issues. Which is the main reason of the change from Obama's view, or from your analysis about Obama's view? I think two things were important. One was pressure from the rest of Latin America. Uh, the Latin American countries were just fed up with the Cuba policy of the United States and its hostility. And the president saw that in 2012 at the sixth summit of the Americas in Cartagena where the rest of the Latin American presidents said, well, we're not coming to another summit if Cuba is not included. This is the summit. This is, the, right. And so I think the United States understood that a, a change in the Cuba policy was really necessary to maintain a good relationship with the rest of the hemisphere. That was number one. Number two was a change in the Cuban-American community. It used to be that that community was absolutely opposed in the majority to any improvement in U.S.-Cuban relations. And uh, Florida is an important state in presidential elections. And so Cuban Americans held a disproportionate political power as a result. But the community has changed. Cubans who have come to the United States more recently uh, come for economic reasons more than political. L less than hate reasons. Yes. yes. And, and they stay in touch with family. They go back to visit. They send remittances. And for them, a normal state-to-state -state relationship is a good thing, not a bad thing. And so now a majority of the Cuban-American community in Miami actually supports an improvement in U.S.-Cuban relations. So that changed the political calculation for presidents in deciding to move and change the policy. The message of Raul Castro about patience was addressed, in your view, to Americans, to Americans diplomats, 
to Cuban government and officials or also to the Cuban people? I think importantly to the Cuban people. Mm. I was in Havana on December 17th when the announcement was made by the oh, two yeah. presidents. And there was, a, the Cubans were jubilant. They were overjoyed. They had this sense of a war coming to an end. And there was an expectation now that the embargo would be lifted quickly and that the, their standard of living would improve, the economy would improve. And I think that one of the messages that Raul Castro has been sending since December 17th to the Cuban people is, this is going to take a long time. The embargo is still in place. The economy is not going to get better overnight. And so I think he's trying to dampen down people's expectations. Uh, he's improving in that purpose? I think he's having some success. Um, I haven't been back to Cuba since December, so I'm not certain. Uh, I know at that point, though, uh, people had very, very, very high expectations. And since then, uh, not only Raul Castro, but Josefina Vidal, the Cuban diplomat who's been negotiating with the United States, has done several interviews with the Cuban television and Cuban press uh, saying the same message, right? This is going to take a long time, it's moving slowly, but we'll get there eventually, but don't have high expectations. Does it mean a change from the United States towards the whole American, uh, Latin American countries? I think, it, I think changing Cuba policy was a necessary condition for the United States to assume a new leadership role in, in the hemisphere. Um, as I say, Latin Americans had become just so frustrated with U.S. policy towards Cuba. We have now many progressive governments in, in Latin America, not only the ALBA countries, but also social democratic uh, governments in Chile and Brazil and so on. Um, and, and so there's a different and Argentina, atmosphere. Argentina, Bolivia. Exactly. In yeah. most of the region now has progressive governments. Um, that, uh, the, so the whole atmosphere of the region itself has changed dramatically from what it was 10 or 15 years ago. And so the United States was really facing a situation where if it didn't begin to change its policy towards Cuba, it was seeing a deterioration in its relations with the hemisphere and in its ability to get hemispheric cooperation on issues important to the United States, narcotics trafficking, migration, and so on. Which was the reason of uh, the declaration from Obama and the, the State Department about Venezuela? Ah. And so, is a threat, yes, et cetera, et cetera. yes. The timing of the announcement on Venezuela was not opportune, obviously, coming just before the summit. Yeah. Um, but I, but the president's hand was forced by Congress. Congress had passed legislation calling on the president to impose sanctions on Venezuela because of the political turmoil there. Uh, he Im he imposed relatively minor sanctions. It only singled out a few individuals was not an economic sanction against the country as a whole or against the economy. But it may be the base or the basement for future restrictions. It also. could be. Yeah, it could, it could be. be, exactly. Um, but not necessarily. Uh, exactly. Uh, the, the declaration that Venezuela was a threat to the United States was something the president had to do legally under the law to be able to use his power to impose the sanctions. In other exactly. words, he did mm -hmm. not have free hand to just yeah. impose sanctions. Uh -huh. He had to do it legally. Yes. And that was a requirement. Um, and, and U.S. diplomats have tried to explain that this did not sing, signal a change in how the United States was viewing the situation in Venezuela, um, but that the United States obviously is not happy with the turmoil and not happy with the government's uh, position in, in regard to the opposition. And so this is an effort to try to get the Venezuelan government to behave a little better. I'm not sure that using the stick is the best strategy to accomplish that, uh, but that was the policy. Now, which would be the carrot in this uh, case? <laughs> well, I, and the carrot, of course, would be a removal of the sanctions and perhaps a, a better relationship. The situation in Venezuela is difficult, obviously, because of the fall in oil prices and the economic stress that that puts on the economy and on the government and the government's ability to provide the kind of social programs that have been so important to building its political support. But it's also difficult in Spain or Portugal or... It is, it is yeah, difficult in Ireland. many, many, many yeah. countries. It is difficult in many, many countries. But, it, but I think the, the, the Chavista government in Venezuela has uh, built a base of political support among the poor. Uh, precisely because it's been able to use its oil revenues to begin to deliver services to that sector uh -huh. of the population. 
if it can't do that anymore because of the fall in oil prices, it creates a political difficulty for the Venezuelan government that I think is in some ways is, is more intense than the problems in, in Spain or, or in other places. Mm -hmm. And the rest of Latin American countries, in your view, are going to be fed up also about the conflict with Venezuela or so I, so I think my sense is that yes. many of the countries in Latin America that have tried to mediate the conflict in Venezuela are frustrated with the Venezuelan government uh, that the Venez they see the Venezuelan government as not having been sufficiently flexible in trying to resolve this conflict um, so and I think that's although there was much criticism of the US sanctions declaration. Uh, I don't think that... Um, even it, in the summit? Even at the summit. Yes. I don't think it reaches anywhere near the level of frustration that people had with Cuba. Um, and part of the reason is the sanctions are so different. I mean, the sanctions on Cuba, which remain in place, uh, are the most comprehensive economic sanctions the United States has against any country in the world. Right? The most comprehensive? The most comprehensive. Uh, the sanctions against Venezuela, in comparison, are relatively minor. Right? So, uh, and, and it's a relatively new situation. And, right? I mean, if it went on for 50 years, I'm sure Latin America would be very frustrated with it. Um, but hopefully the situation in, in the political situation in Venezuela will stabilize and the sanctions will be removed relatively soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Dialogue. William Leo Grande, profesor de gobierno de la American University en Claxo TV, Laza, Puerto Rico.